Good morning again and welcome to this morning's dental hygiene mini class and program overview. I'm joined today by Professor Marcy Roger of the Regis College Dental Hygiene Program. Um, typically we would be offering this cool session physically at our dental hygiene clinic in Waltham, Massachusetts, our brand new clinic. Um, but in light of COVID-19 and in an abundance of caution, we're gonna provide this for you virtually today. <laughs> However, please note that the dental clinic is available for tour on our virtual tour. So if you haven't checked it out, please make sure to uh, check out the virtual tour to see that space. And we do look forward to having everybody there um, soon once it is safe to do so. So as mentioned, I am pleased to present this morning, Professor Marcy Roger and this morning's mini class, the Modified Pen Grass. Professor. Thank you. Uh, good, mo good morning. We're so excited to have you all here. Um, so as we were saying, uh, my name is Maurice Roger. Um, I'm the assistant professor here at Regis College, and I'm also the sophomore clinic coordinator. So once you do get into your first year, you and I will be spending a lot of time together, uh, three to four days a week. We'll be spending a lot of time together in the classroom and in the clinic as well. I have been an educator for 18 years, and I'm also a practicing dental hygienist um, that I've been doing, doing for a little over 20 years. Um, other than that, that's, that's kind of about it. Uh, last week when I was thinking about, okay, what do I wanna do for a presentation for you guys? What would be the most beneficial as to, um, for you to kind of take something away from, from this Zoom class. It's a, a little different than what we're used to doing, um, but I still want you to walk away from this um, remembering something or take something away that, that you'll be thinking about over, over the summer. And as you work in private practice and as you become a dental hygienist, and as you go in to get your teeth clean, I want you to you know, think about the things that we're going to be going over today. When you're sitting getting your teeth cleaned, that hygienist is holding that instrument a certain way. They're moving that instrument a certain way. It's held in their hand a certain way. Um, so today that's something that we're going to go through. Um, you don't just pick up an instrument and just kind of go for it. It's held in your hand a certain way that will allow you to do what kind of, what kind of needs to be done. So we'll get started right now, and we're gonna go over the modified pen grasp. If it'll let me move forward. And it won't. I'm gonna stop sharing that, Laura, and see. Okay, I can share, um, oh, there you go. I did, okay, it just went, okay. <clears throat> so with every PowerPoint that you'll see and that you get throughout your dental hygiene career, we always go through the learning objectives. And these are more so the key points that we want you to focus on. Um, this is what we want you to really remember it, not only for the quizzes, but also to kind of move on as you move on with your dental hygiene career. So let's go over to, the, first we're gonna start going over the parts of the instrument. Um, there are three parts to a dental instrument. There's A, the handle, B, the shank, and C, the working end. So if we're looking at that top instrument, which is your mirror, that handle is the A part, what's called the shank is the B, and the mirror part, that circular part, is your working end. Now we're going to move down to your middle instrument, and it's kind of the same thing, but this is a scalar that you would actually take calculus off with. So you also have, again, the handle, then you have what's called the shank, and that little tip part is the working end. That's what actually takes the calculus off, off of the teeth. So the modified pengrass is the recommended method for holding your periodontal instrument. It gives you precise control over that instrument. So you can guide it in the right direction that you're moving. It allows detection of rough areas on the tooth surface. It allows detection of calculus or possibly any fillings that the patient might have. It also less, less, lessens the musculoskeletal stress so that you don't have to apply a lot of stress 
into those areas. You've heard of people having carpal tunnel or um, you know, hand numbness. And by holding an instrument in a certain way, it lessens that that could possibly happen in the future because you're using the muscles you need to be using and not others that you don't. So is the modified pen grasp the same grasp that you use when you're writing, whether you're left-handed, whether you're right-handed, doesn't matter. It is not the same grasp that you use when you're using your pen or your pencil. It's much more precise. Um, it's much more dictated as to which area your hand is resting on. So it can appear as you look at it when your hygienist is working or cleaning your teeth that it's kind of the same grasp, but it's not the case. So we're gonna start off with your thumb and your index finger. So as I look at this slide, we're gonna always be looking at the placement of the finger on either the handle, the shank, or the working end. And then we're gonna look at the function of those two fingers. So starting with your thumb and your index, you can see this pink area here. This is where it contacts. This part of your index finger contacts the handle. This portion of your thumb contacts the handle. So the placement of the thumb and the index is it goes on the handle portion of the instrument. And the whole reason behind it, it's just to hold the instrument in place, to keep it where it is. So the thumb and the index, you grasp the handle very, very lightly. You hold it in a relaxed manner. The joints here, your thumb and your index, kind of make a nice round C shape. So the knuckles are sticking out. It's in a nice, comfortable, neutral position. Resting, and you can see these tips here, resting right on that handle. Blanched fingers. If you are grasp, have this grasp here and you are pressing too tight, you can get what's called blanching, which means your fingers turn white because you're pressing too hard. And you don't wanna be pressing too hard. If you're pressing too hard, not only is that going to stress your fingers and your hands out, but your patient can feel that as well. And that's not a comfortable situation for your patient. So the handle placement. So where is this handle right up in here going to rest? It has to rest up against the hand. That'll give you stabilization. It'll help you control it. Instruments, they are very light, but you're working a lot with your hands. By resting that on there, it decreases those chances of you getting any hand issues. And now let's move on to your middle finger. What is the placement going to be? It's going to rest against the shank. So a little different than your, than your thumb and your index, which were on the handle. Now the middle finger will actually rest on the shank. And the portion of it, this portion of your finger is what is contacting that shank. So the function of it is to guide the working end. So it's guiding it where it needs to go, whether it's towards the front of the tooth, the back of the tooth, the top of the tooth. It's guiding that in certain directions. It's also feeling for vibrations. So the vibrations that you would be feeling might be any roughness that we talked about earlier, any calculus that you might be going over, any fillings that you might be going over. It's feeling those vibrations and it's transferring those vibrations from the working end all the way up to that shank. So the middle finger, the side of the finger pad, it rests very lightly. Again, you heard the word lightly when you were grasping with your thumb and your index. Same thing with your middle finger. It's resting very lightly on that shank you should actually be able to lift that middle finger without dropping that instrument at all. 
because if you remember, your thumb and your index are the one that's holding the instrument. Your middle finger is just guiding it. Now let's move on to your ring finger. Here is the portion that is going to rest. The placement is going to be on an oral structure. It will, might be on a tooth. It could be on another finger. Um, it could be on the cheek somewhere. But it's the fingertip here that will be resting, not the whole pad, just that tip. So the function of your ring finger is to stabilize and support and for the hand to control and the strength. That's where your strength comes from, is from that ring finger. That's where your power comes from when you're removing calculus, is from that ring finger. Your ring finger should always stand straight and tall. It should be a head. See how the others are bent? And here's that ring finger, straight and tall. Nice, powerful, stabilized. It also works as your support beam to help stabilize and control that. Fingernails length must not be too long for that ring finger. True for the other ones, but especially for that ring finger. Because imagine if you have really nice, long, beautiful nails and you're resting on the gingiva. That's gonna dig right into the patient's tissues. Not gonna be very comfortable. So those of you that are starting in the fall, enjoy your nails this summer. And I've been enjoying my nails um, recently since we haven't been in, in clinic. So it's been nice to have the nail polish on and be nice to have the long nails. Um, but once we're, we're back at it, those fingernails have to go. So here, look at these, don't they look beautiful? Don't you wish you could go get those done? Um, so imagine this nail here, right on the gingiva. Wouldn't feel too good for your patient. And then if you look here, you can't get on the pads of your fingers that you need to because those fingernails are interfering with that grasp. So your pinky, your little finger, it is near the ring finger. It's held in a relaxed manner. And the function, excuse me, it has no function. It doesn't do anything. It just hangs out near that, that ring finger. So here's that modified pen grasp. United we stand, the index, the middle finger, the ring finger and the little finger, they should all be in contact at one point. So they're all touching. They're not what we call splitting. They're not spread apart. They're all together. They're stronger together than they are apart. So here's that stability that you need and that strength that you need in that grasp. Once you first start doing this, we're gonna start talking to you guys about muscle memory. When you pick up your pencil to start working or writing, you don't think about how you're gonna write your name. It's muscle memory, you already have that. But when you were five years old and first started writing, it wasn't as easy. Same thing with this. It takes time. When you first start getting this, you're going to feel awkward. At this point, our students, they don't think about what their grasp is going to be like. They just pick up the instrument and they go at this point in the semester. But back in September, they had to think about the placement of each and every finger when they started until they got that muscle memory. Oops. Okay, so if you have a pen, a pen or a pencil nearby, um, pick one up. I'll give you guys a second or two. If you want to join in on this little exercise and pen or a pencil, doesn't matter. We're gonna kind of start labeling the handle, the shank and the working end. So here on this pencil, we have the handle, we have the shank here, and then that little tip is going to be our working end. And kind of the same thing if you have a pen with you. So we're gonna look at your thumb and your index finger. The function is to hold that instrument and it's gonna be placed on that handle. So if I have my pen here, I'm gonna grab my thumb and my index and I'm just gonna put it right on that handle 
of my pen. They're going to be opposite each other, so they're not going to be touching. There's going to be a space in between so that those fingers are not overlapping. There's going to be that space held in between that thumb and that index finger. Nice C shape, kind of hard to see. Here's the C shape, the knuckles are out. And everything is being held in a nice relaxed manner and there's no blanching. So I'm not seeing any whiteness that's coming through. And here's your thumb and your index finger. So your middle finger, your middle finger is resting right on that shank, right? It's gonna feel those vibrations in that relaxed manner. And here it is resting right on that shank. And your ring finger, stabilize, support, control, strength. Mm -hmm. That's where your power is coming from. Your little, sorry, let me go back one more. Your ring finger that stabilizes the control, the placement firmly, it's gonna be on a tooth. It's gonna to be on the cheek side, the tongue side of the tooth. It could be on a cheek and that's where it's gonna rest. Your little finger, what's the function of your little finger? Does nothing, right? It doesn't do anything. It hangs out, doesn't go out to tea because sometimes that will happen. It kind of has a mind of its own and goes out to tea. It's just resting right near, and here it is here, right near that ring finger, okay? So finger length, as we look at our own hands, some people have longer fingers, some people have shorter fingers. This will actually determine where your fingers will rest on the handle. Sometimes they'll be a little closer to the shank, sometimes they'll be a little further up on that handle. They might be placed a little bit different. So each clinician, each of you will have to adjust in order, depending on what your finger length is. So if you have shorter fingers, you'll tend to hold the knuckles of the index finger more of a knuckles up, so more curved. So you might have more of a C shape there because those knuckles will be sticking out just a little bit more. If you have shorter fingers, you're also gonna grasp that handle a little higher. So you're not going to be, say, here. You're going to be a little higher on that. And then if you have longer fingers, it'll be just the opposite. You're going to be more with less, you're going to be less of a curve, but you're going to be a little further down on that handle. You're still on the handle, you're just a little further down. So if you look at the difference between the two, the shorter fingers, you're a little further up. And then the longer fingers, you're a little further down on that handle. So let's take a look at this picture here. Now after the slides, I know you can all kind of pick out certain things that are not falling into where they should be in this photo. Does anybody want to unmute themselves and see what they're seeing in, that's incorrect with this photo? Anybody want to chime in? No? Let's look at this finger here. Remember how we talked about thumb and index? They should be directly across from each other. That's nice. Right? So we see how this one's too far up. They're not across from each other. Okay, it's too far up. It's going to stress this finger out here, causing this finger, your index finger, to work a little bit more than it has to work because it's not in that united we stand. So incorrect finger placement, the index and the thumb are not across from each other. Very difficult to control that instrument there. And here I talked, remember how we talked about united we stand. What are we seeing here with these fingers? See the spaces in there? They're not together. Your hand has to work so much more because they're not together. They're not working together like a unit. So split ring and middle fingers. That's the space, that's the splitting that we're seeing in between. There's no point of contact with those fingers. You have a weak grasp there and it stresses those muscles out. What are we seeing here? 
to see the grass. The grass. Yep. Look right in here. Do you see how there's no space in between that thumb and that index finger? Okay. And that thumb, it's not resting right on that pad of the finger. It's kind of resting almost on the knuckle portion. So the overlap of the thumb and the index. Difficult to roll the instrument when you're going into those interproximal in between those teeth. And there's no space in between that thumb and that index finger. Okay. What am I seeing here? This one's a good one. I love this slide. It's not a soft C. It's not a soft C. And look at where that handle is. You're going to have a hard time controlling that. And then look at these too fingers here. What's happening here? Putting too much pressure in the instrument. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Way too much pressure. Holding that instrument too much, too tight. Your hands are working too hard there. You're going to go home. If you're doing this all day, you're going to go home in pain. Okay. And your patients are going to feel that as well. So there's no handle rest. You're holding the handle and that pinch grip away from the hand. And you're getting that weak, unstable grasp. And then as someone mentioned, the blanching, the whiteness that you're seeing, it's way too tight, way too tight. And the ring finger is not piv pivoting for stability of the hand. So they're talking about that ring finger. Remember how that ring finger needs to be straight and tall. So you have the support, you have the control, you have the strength coming and you can't because it's bent there. What do we see in here? Pressure on the index finger. Pressure. Yep. And, and let's the the finger is not it's splitting. It's splitting. Yep. And what else? I think somebody started to mention it. What's this finger middle, doing? The middle finger is bent and it's not resting. Right, it's not resting where it should be, exactly. It's not resting on that shank. It's resting on the handle. Shouldn't be on the handle, right? The ring finger almost looks like it's resting on that shank. It Even does, it's doesn't not, it? Not, but, yeah. it's not, but it just looks like it a little bit. Yeah, it kind of does. I'm not sure if it is, but it, it kind of does look like that it's resting. So it's kind of that incorrect finger placement. So the middle finger is not on the, is, um, not on the, is on the handle, should be on that shank. And that reduces the tactile information. So that reduces the, the vibrations that are traveling up the shank. You can't feel that roughness. You can't feel that calculus. And it reduces that control of that instrument there. Okay, that's what I have for today. And I saw, I took a webinar last week and um, at the end of this webinar, they had this quote and I said, oh, this is gonna be perfect, I love it. Um, it just kind of fits into where we are. And Charles Darwin, um, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And I think it just kind of fits into our lives right now, I think. Um, so does anyone, does anyone have any questions? Um, this is, this was kind of one of the, kind of one of the first PowerPoints that you'll kind of run into uh, within your first couple of weeks of, of dental hygiene. Um, but you know, a, a lot of it is we go through the PowerPoints, we go over it in class, we kind of practice it in class, kind of like what we would have done now with, with the pens, only you'd be doing it in instruments. And then we go into the clinical setting and then you apply what you've learned in, uh, in, in the clinical setting. Great. Thank you so much, Professor. This is really um, interesting and fascinating, and I think it highlights just truly the technical nature of the dental hygiene field, and every single element of it is so nuanced and um, so precise. And for that reason, I know as um, somebody who has you know, really watched our program, and seeing our students work in that program, just appreciate the level of expertise that our program brings to the education. So first question coming out of the gate, um, how many students get accepted into the program? So it's a highly competitive program. Um, I can pull in the acceptance numbers. What I would say is this, um, the program for our incoming sophomores, so I know some of you are transfer students, there um, are two spots left for transfer students for the fall 20 group. And then for our incoming um, freshmen, that program spot is starting to fill 
as well. Um, it is a competitive program and you know the caliber of candidate um, is really impressive and we were really impressed with this year's um, candidates as well. But there is a capacity for how many individuals can come in the program. Um, under accreditation guidelines, you cannot have more than 36 students moving into the sophomore experience. So for those of you that are coming in as intended dental hygiene students or otherwise known as freshmen, um, we cannot move more than 36 into the sophomore year. So we won't allow a large group to come in as freshmen as to um, make sure that everybody who's qualified is able to move through. During that freshman year, you are what's called an intended dental hygiene student. That status is reserved only for those students who have been admitted though as dental hygiene candidates. At the end of that freshman year, um, you, the program will review you to make sure you've completed all of your prerequisite requirements and that you've met all the GPA standards and then you officially move in to that program. But again, just to reiterate, the only students that can be up for consideration are students who've been admitted as intended dental hygiene. For those of you that are coming in as transfer students, some of you are finishing up those prereqs now or finishing them up over the summer. So will um, be in constant communication with you just to check in on the status of those as well to make sure that um, you're moving forward with those as well. Great question, other questions? Everybody's so quiet this morning. Okay. They are, they are. <laughs> and I know I see a lot of very familiar names, so I know some of you have been to our clinic. I've met some of you. Um, at the um, open houses that we had at the clinic in the last couple of years, so that's been great. Um, it's a four-year program, yes. So what happens is at the end of year three, you are conferred an associate's degree that allows you to sit for your licensing examination, and then year four is your bachelor completion um, year. Um, so it is a four-year program, but just know at the end of year three, you are conferred um, that associate's degree that is required in order to move into year four. Um, the next question, does the cost go up after freshman year? So um, generally speaking, every year there's some level of a tuition adjustment. Um, and so with that, keep in mind that every year you also reapply for any financial aid. And so that financial aid could shift. Your scholarship, if you receive scholarship, your scholarship stays the same um, all throughout your time as a full-time student. Um, everything we learn in class, will we have act? Oh, this is a great question for you, Professor. Everything we learn in class, Will we have access to all the PowerPoints to review or review with a faculty member? Yes, um, so we use um, a Moodle, kind of a, a baseboard where all of the homework and the PowerPoints get posted. So a week ahead of time, we open up, we open up that week, you have time to do your reading and you also have time to review the PowerPoints before you come into class, if, if you choose. And then those PowerPoints, everything stays up until the end of the semester when the course actually closes. Um, as for reviewing the PowerPoints, we do that when we're, when we're in the classroom, we go through the PowerPoints, we go through questions, then we go through into the clinic and kind of, and kind of do the same thing that you've learned, you've learned that day. And to expand on that too, all of our students have access to our academic support center on campus, otherwise known as the Finucane O'Sullivan Institute of Learning. So all of our students have access to an academic coach. And then with that, um, all of our students have access to our tutoring services, group tutoring, writing workshops. So um, those item, those opportunities are also facilitated through the university. And you will find when you come into the university, you're automatically so assigned an academic coach. All first year students, um, you will um, be required to meet with your coach at least once. That's just to meet with this person. and. This is a staff member um, who is a professional academic coach who will work with you on everything from that time management and planning out what a collegiate schedule looks and feels like to how to plan out that 30 page research paper and make sure that you have time to do that. Um, they're also there to help you with study techniques. So, you know, studying for, you know, a science based exam may feel different than studying for a humanities based exam. And, Maybe you've never had to study for an exam that is written in a board exam style. So they also work with students um, like that um, and help with that support too. 
another great um, just to point. piggyback, just yes. to piggyback off that, Laura, as well. When you do get into the dental hygiene program, the tutor that you have will end up being um, one of the junior students that has already taken the course. Um, so they're dentally related, and it's not just another tutor who's not in the program. So we do um, have tutors that are dental hygiene tutors as your sophomore, but they will be your junior students that have passed the course very successfully. Awesome. Okay. Um, Thank you. No, of course. Additional questions. Um, are there dental hygiene dues? And can you talk a little bit about the fees for scrubs and instruments and how students acquire those? Yes. So um, in the summer, we have what's called try on days, fit in days. And we take a day that um, usually it's July. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen this year. Um, but so the vendors all come in and you get fitted for gloves. You get fitted for your lab coats. And then everything is all set. You get your supplies on just what we call distribution day, which is the very, very first day of classes in September, which is usually the Tuesday after Labor Day. Okay. And it's about, you do have to buy all of, all of your supplies. Um, it ends up being about $3,000. So on top of the tuition that you end up having having to to spend, um, but and that, that happens the summer between your freshman and sophomore year, going into your first year as yes. a clinical student. Yes. Yep. That summer we have we have you try everything on that need. We have a fit in day. You come in. We do all the ordering. It comes in. Everything's all set. The vendors are all there, and then. Um, you get everything that that very first day for that year. Thank and we you. only buy it once, right? Oh, we have to do it like every year, like the, the scrubs oh. and lab. Well, that you only have to buy once. And then the following year, you get two new kits. So it's not as expensive. It might be an, an extra $800 your sophomore, your, your sophomore year going into your junior year, going into your last year because you just buy um, two new kits. It's the fall semester that you, you know, you need clinic shoes, you need a lot, you need lab coats, you, you kind of need everything, you get the bulk of everything that first, that first year. So definitely that, that first year is when you kind of get hit with, with, with most of it. And instruments, we only buy it once, right? You buy two kits in the fall before your first year, okay. and then you buy two more periodontal kits, so they're more advanced instruments, you're going into your last year of dental hygiene. Are they about the same price? About the same price for the instruments, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but you're not buying everything else again. You're not buying scrubs again. You're not you know, buying all that, that other stuff again. So it ends up being a little bit, a little bit less that that following year great great okay. questions um i have a question about prerequisites so if you are in and i'm going to break this into two different categories if you are an incoming first year student your freshman year schedule is designed with your prerequisites in mind so you are mapped into that dental hygiene experience if you are an incoming transfer candidate on your transfer credit evaluation that you will receive um, from academic advising and um, your admission officer, it outlines what those outstanding prerequisites are. Um, if you have not received that for some reason, um, please let us know and we will make sure you get that. Um, but academic advising will also alert you that, you know, you, these are your outstanding prereqs before moving into the program. And those prereqs would need to be finished before you can officially start um, that clinical experience, which, Again, you can only start the clinical experience in the fall. There is not a January start for this program. So it's a um, fall start. Um, another great question. Um, do you use the same books each year or do those books rotate each semester, each class? Some, some of them do. So you have a Wilkins and a Darby that you're going to buy that you will use all four semesters. Um, those are the key books that probably every single class will have some readings in. Um, they're probably about this thick. Um, so you do use those every semester. 
and then um, when you have different classes, you will also have to buy different books. So even though you're taking pathology, you'll still be take, buying a pathology book. So every semester, yes, you are buying new books. But again, with that said, your first semester is going to be the most expensive one because that's when you are buying the Wilkins and the Darby that you will use for a few other classes. But every semester, you are buying other books as well. I hope that answers your question. A great question. Um, how much, Professor, do you see de the dental hygiene changing due to quarantine and everything we're dealing with now and the cleanliness of uniforms and how we're maintaining you know, appropriate protocols in light of all this? Do you want to give a little update as to what's sure. going on now? I mean, we've been, I've been joining a lot of webinars over the last couple of weeks as to you know, what the CDC is going to do and what our life as hygienists is going to look like after um, COVID-19. And there's definitely going to be some changes with the protocols as to what we're wearing. We have never, well, we have not worn uh, face shields in a while. So that is something that the CDC is really looking at. Um, N95 masks is something that we've, we've never worn. Um, that is, we're not quite sure because again, we're, we're attending all of these meetings as things were coming out and nothing is definite yet. Um, but my thought process is that's the way that we're going. We're going to be needing those N95 masks in order, in order to be working. Um, other than that, as far as your career goes, uh, I mean, last week I had a dentist, a friend of mine call and say, I need a hygienist to start working, you know, right after the 18th. Do you know anybody? So I don't think career wise, this is going to affect too much. Um, people need their teeth clean. People are in pain. Uh, people will still need what they, they, they kind of need. Um, it's just more so the infection control process. Um, I also have a friend of mine who's opening her practice um, right after the 18th and she has, she has a full schedule already. Um, there isn't going to be a waiting room. Her patients are going to be out in the car. The front office is going to text them when, you know, that other person has left and walked out the door and then they're going to walk in and walk right into an operatory. Um, so as there's going to be some changes, um, but I think, I, I think the CDC's, everybody's on it and everybody's working and, and, doing what they're supposed to be doing in order yeah. to kind of try to get the economy kind of back up and going. Um, and Stephanie, I see your question, but I'm going to actually bounce to the next question first and then go back to your question because it dovetails nicely into um, what we were just discussing. So in terms of what campus looks like in the fall, we are in the process of looking at multiple contingency plans and multiple um, scenarios for how we will um, open this fall, um, whether that's on campus and mix of on campus and remote. So we will continue to update everybody um, in our community and in our external community as those decisions are made. Um, but we are continuing to monitor it and look at what are our various options and opportunities to continue, you know, this fall in a way that honors not just our educational services, but also honors the safety and all local, state, and federal guidance around um, COVID. Um, in terms of the, so moving to the other question, does a C letter grade affect a student from staying in the program? Um, do you want to speak a little bit, um, about how program progression works in grading in those prereqs and then the major courses? Right. So your your pre your prereqs and I have this and I have this here um, in your sciences what we're mainly looking for I mean again it, it is it is a competitive program um, but we're not we're looking for those B minuses nothing lower than a B minuses in those prereq courses just because dental hygiene it's it is it's a lot of science um, so those B minuses anything lower um but we're really looking for anything that's higher b minus or higher in your sciences your prereqs uh, a 3-0 or higher with your combined gpa going into the program um 
But if you get into the program and then you end up with a C in dental materials, um, it's not as though you're out at that point, if that's kind of where you're going with that, with that question. Does that answer your question, Stephanie? I think that was Stephanie. So once you're kind of in, if you get a C, then that's okay. It's just a matter of, of getting those B minuses and those sciences in order, in order to get into the program. And um, one of the, oh, sorry. And then one of the other questions right above was how many patients are you required to work on from um, once you're in the program? That depends on the semester. Your very first semester, we start off with, with typodonts with those fake teeth, and then you progress to working on each other. And then your second semester is when you start seeing real patients. So you need six patients that very first semester, your spring year, the first semester you're working on patients. Um, but oh the fall there are no patients that you're working on in the spring is where you need the six and then that number increases as the semester goes on and that's a per accreditation requirement you need to see so many patients and you need to have so many hours of clinical time in order to graduate from a dental hygiene program i have a question on that um do we have to get the six patients ourselves or are they going to be assigned from the clinic some of them are assigned and some of them page, uh, students get themselves. Um, COVID-19, I mean, we don't know what's, what's obviously going, going to happen with, with all this. Um, a, lot of pay, a lot of students will bring in their own patients. Um, the juniors get the first dibs, of course, because they're juniors. So they get all the patients and then the sophomores within those six, they kind of get the overflow there of patients. Um, but where we're in Waltham and we're close to the train, we're close to, to 128. Um, we are in a great location for people just to, to kind of come in. It's, it's a lot easier to get patients in Waltham than it is, say, if the clinic were right on the Regis campus, just because of the access for transportation for individuals. The other element of that is that the Regis community itself promotes the dental clinic and the dental services yep. as a um, opportunity for our students, our faculty, our staff, our alum, our families um, to utilize that resource as well. So we also, as a university, promote the dental clinic as a place for people to get high quality and cost friendly um, dental care. So in addition to you know, the individual students, we also, as a university, are really committed to make sure that people utilize this resource. So I think that's really um, important. Um, there was a question that was earlier that I just want to go back to. Um, are all the dental hygiene courses at the dental center, including the lecture, or are some on the Weston campus? It's, it's kind of divided. There are some classes that you take. Um, kind of like the PowerPoint I just went over today that is from um, your 103 class. And right after that class, we go right into the clinic and apply what we learned in the lecture into the clinic. So that class is actually held in Waltham because you end up with a 15 minute break and then we end up going right into, right into the clinic. Um, so it's not as though all the lectures are on the Weston campus. It depends. If we're going into a lab then and we need the lab session we need the clinic then that class is held in Waltham um, if we don't then it's held on the Weston campus and for those who have not been to our clinic or our Weston campus to give you a sense of proximity um, to go from the Weston campus to the clinic is about a five minute drive um, and then we also do, depending on student need, run a shuttle service if students do not have their own vehicle, but it's not an extensive drive to, between the two facilities. Um, it's actually a single back road that will bring you there if you don't want to go on 95. And if you go on 95, it's um, one exit. So it is in very close proximity, which is really intentional as well. Yes, it is very, very close proximity. and. And, um, you know, the director works really hard and has worked really hard on kind of getting the schedule. So it's not as though you have one class in, in Weston and then you're back at the clinic and then you're back for another class in Weston again. Um, you're either, we try to have you be either at one place or at another so that you're yeah. not bouncing back and forth so much during, during the day. Right. 
And those clinical, those classes that are held at the Weston, I'm sorry, at the Waltham Clinic don't begin until sophomore year. So for the question that's in the chat box, can we have a car on campus your freshman year? So if you are coming directly as a first year student, um, residential freshmen cannot have vehicles on campus. Commuter students certainly can. Your sophomore year though, which is when you would begin your clinical experience, yes, you can have a vehicle on um, campus. Mm -hmm. Good, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Are there other questions? Um, somebody asked, um, are there volunteer hours options we can do at other dental offices once we start our clinicals? Uh, no, I mean, we don't, once you do start clinical, you'll go on externships, but that's not until your junior year that um, you go to um, healthcare facilities and work there for, for hours. But there's no volunteer um, options that, that we have to work at, to work at dental offices until, until you start. Um, in that same vein though, the institution does host a series of service immersion trips over our spring break or winter intercession. One of those is a trip to Appalachia which provides medical care. And I know that the dental hygiene program has expressed um, interest in starting to send some dental hygiene students along with our nursing students to provide that. So there also are those on-campus opportunities. Um, similarly, because of who we are as a university, I think you'll also find there's great ways to engage uniquely with our campus, whether that's supporting our student athletes by getting their mouth guards, which serves you know, their safety and welfare, but also provides you with those necessary clinical experiences, but we also have a children's center and a um, children's autism clinic on campus. And so those are also opportunities where our dental hygiene students go into our children's center. It's a, it's a award-winning preschool and provide dental education um, to the youngest members of our community. And then similarly to the earlier question about finding patients, Regis also has what's called the lifelong learning at Regis College program which is a academic program for older members of our community. And they also are aware of the various opportunities to receive dental care and um, dental experiences mm -hmm. with Regis. So again, it really is a neat opportunity because you could work with somebody that's a Regis community member that's two years old, and you could also work with somebody that's a Regis community member that's 95 years old. So it's, just a, it's really a neat experience. And let me add on to that. Maybe I was reading that, that question incorrectly. Um, about the volunteer hours. So the dental clinic, we do a lot with the students. Um, you do have to do some service hours. So we do uh, like a mission of mercy. Um, there's one in Rhode Island, there's one in, in Connecticut. Um, our public, we have a public health hygienist that works with us that, you know, has a lot of volunteer hours at, um, you know, whether it just be taking blood pressures for the, for the community. Um, doing oral cancer screenings at, at nursing homes. Um, so there's, there is a lot of uh, Special Olympics, which is usually held in, in June. We do um, just, again, oral cancer screenings, blood, pr blood pressure screenings. We also do a, a CHIPS program where we take bite registrations um, so they can get documented for, for children. Um, so there are a lot, if that's kind of where the, the question was going, um, a lot of volunteer opportunities that way, but not specifically in a dental office working as, you know, a, a hygienist or an assistant. Great. Thank you. How many students will start in the program in the fall and what is the student success ratio by the time of graduation? So um, moving into, and Harney, if I recall, you are an incoming transfer student, correct? So you'll be starting with our sophomore clinic class. So right now there are um, 34 of you in that cohort. Um, again, we have two spots available and um, we anticipate those to be filled um, very quickly. Um, and then in terms of the graduation rate, um, Marcy, do you wanna talk historically about how many of our students that start the program persist in the program um, in, in that regard, you know, their board exams and the success and the outcome of our students. Yeah, um, it's that all, it's all a little bit different every, every year, I'd say. Um, I mean, it's, you know, with that said, it's, it, it is a difficult program. Um, it's a lot of hard work. It's a very busy two years of your life. Um, once you're, you're actually in the program, 
um, because once you start doing clinicals and you're doing clinicals two days a week, it's, you know, it's kind of like you're working two days a week because you have patients uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, eight to five. Um, and then you're doing your, cl your classwork. Um, so, I mean, it is a, t it is a tough program. The success rate, it's, you know, a lot of it depends on, you know, how hard you work. We do have a remediation program. So if you're not, or if you're kind of averaging right at the C and it's more clinical C and not academic where you're getting help with the tutors, um, we have a remediation program that you can work with an instructor one-on-one -on -one so that you can get the skill. Because as I said, a lot of it is muscle memory. And once you get that muscle memory and it clicks, it's a lot easier to progress into the program because what you learn on day one, you have to know on the very last day before a graduation. So it's not as though you're like, oh yeah, I'm done with this class, moving on to the next one. In order to be successful, in order to pass your boards, you have to know what you're learning on day one in order to be successful when you're applying for your dental hygiene license. And if um, it was vice versa, if you needed more help, more academically, then- That's when the tutors that's, come in. Okay. Yep, that's when the dental hygiene tutors come in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are a couple of questions that all kind of thread together. So um, we presently um, do not have a master's in dental hygiene. However, you can move into our other master's programs. Our, you know, we have a master's in health administration. We have um, an MBA program. So you can move into that master's program. Um, we can talk a little bit about that master's in dental hygiene um, and what that looks like in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the greater. Uh, at the end of the junior year, yes, you are going to be sitting for your board exam. Um, do you want to talk about what those exams look like? How many there are national, regional? So there are, there are five exams that you actually have to take. Um, one of which most students, actually, I don't even think we've ever had one who didn't take it. Um, but in the fall of your junior year, you take a local anesthesia course where you, you learn how to give injections, do them on each other. And in between that winter break is when we've always recommended to students, you know, take that exam. You can take it as soon as the course is taken. And I mean, every year that they've been doing that, we've had a 100% success rate because they're not waiting till April to take that exam. They're taking their final exam in the course. And then a week later, they're taking that board exam. Um, so the, every, the, the information is just so fresh. The material is so fresh in their head that it makes it, it, makes it a little easier. Um, so that one, it's usually taken in, in between the fall and the spring semester of your junior year. And then uh, towards the end of that spring before you, before you graduate, some of them are taken before you graduate, some of them are taken um, right after, you have a clinical portion um, exam that you have to find a certain patient and you have to clean them. It's um, a board exam and you have a national exam, an eight hour written exam that has to be taken. And then you have a computer simulated exam, which is a lot of x-rays, um, a lot of case studies. And then your last one is a state jurisprudence ethics exam. Um, so those are the four that are usually taken end of April, beginning of May. Um, the written one, some people have taken it during spring break. Some people have studied all of spring break and then before they come back after spring break, um, they, they take the exam. Um, so it, it depends on the individual. Um, you do need the okay from the director that says, okay, you can kind of take this exam before you kind of get your final grades type of thing. Um, but, but other than that, um, it's, it's five, five exams that, that are taken in order to get your RDH, your registered dental hygienist license. So it doesn't take long to get the results. So sometimes I've known some students that are right on the ball and take everything right away. They're working at the end of May and then others kind of take their time to take those last few exams and they're, you know, working in June or July, um, depending on how proactive, how proactive you want to be. Okay. Thank you. Great questions. Yes, definitely. We are starting to come up on time, but I want to make sure if there's any last questions that people have the opportunity to ask them. 
Um, and then certainly if you have a question after this, please don't hesitate um, to reach out to any of us directly. Everybody here has my email address and then of course the admission email address. And many of you, um, especially those of you who are transfer candidates have worked really closely um, with members of our team, especially Marissa. And I know Marissa's on today's call too. I see some head nods at that. Um, so certainly if we can help answer any questions whatsoever, um, we want to make sure we can do that. So I just wanna add one more thing, just in case there's any confusion, someone had asked earlier, is this a four year program? So it, um, it is the four, a four year program, um, but you can, once you graduate, cause you will be graduating with an associate in your junior year. So essentially in three years, when you graduate, you'll be able to start working that summer. And then your last two semesters um, are mostly, some of them are online and some of them will be at, on, on, the Regis, on the Regis campus. Um, but at that point, your last semester, you could actually still be working clinically. Mm -hmm. So you'll essentially be graduating twice. Yes, exactly. You'll be conferred two degrees from Regis and Associates in Dental Hygiene, or, um, and then a bachelor's as well. And, then a and bachelor's. your bachelor's degree will have a concentration. You'll either do the education concentration that fourth year or the business concentration that fourth year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? I didn't know if you guys were aware of that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Well, Thank you everybody again for joining us today. Professor Roger, thank you for that. I was diligently trying to hold my pen um, in you were. <laughs> the proper format and I think it reaffirmed that I am better a patient than a practitioner most certainly and so I am grateful for all of you that have um, the wherewithal dexterity and ability to do this because it is such a technical field and uh, we are just always so impressed by the expertise of our faculty in this program and also the expertise of our students. One of the greatest events in my opinion that we have every spring is when our dental hygiene students present their research. Um, and it really speaks again to just how much they know about their field and um, the importance of oral health. And as Regis continues its growth and continues to look at new ways to provide patient care in all levels, dental hygiene really is an area where we're just so glad to fill that community. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for their time this morning. Um, for some of you, I think you're hopping on to a general institutional info session at 1130. But again, if not, we look forward to talking with many of you, speaking with all of you, and don't hesitate to reach out. Wish you all continued good health. Wish your families continued good health. And we look forward to seeing everybody again real soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care and stay safe. Go. That was wonderful. Oh, I got to oh, turn. Good. Let me stop my recording.